Hi, it's Katrina, the Dashka Stone. I've covered a lot of stone tablets on this channel, but none of them have been quite as controversial as the Dashka Stone, also known as the Map of the Creator. Some believe this tablet to be the guideline used by whoever created the planet. As impossible as that may seem, this could be a map up to 120 million years old. The Dashka Stone was discovered in July of 1999 by archaeologists from Bashkir State University in the Ural Mountains of Russia. All these years later, after countless attempts to decipher it, nobody has been successful. But there are many theories, of course. The tablet not only depicts the landscape of the Ural Mountains, it shows 12,000 kilometers of civil engineering projects, including dams, canals, and what looks like some mysterious writing. To some, this thing is scary accurate, as if whoever created it had an aerial view. But how would that even be possible? And that's not even the craziest part. The Dashka stone is surprisingly large. I mean, I guess it has to be to fit all that information. It's almost five feet tall, three and a half feet wide, and six inches thick. It's also surprisingly heavy, weighing about one ton. Alexander Chuvirov, a professor of archaeology from Bashkir State, led a team of Russian and Chinese scientists to investigate the tablet. They were shocked to find that the stone seems to show a precise topographical map of Bashkiria, a specific place in the Ural Mountains, complete with details like mountains and rivers that are still there. Dr. Chuvirov decided to name the stone Dashka after his granddaughter, who just happened to be born on the same day of the discovery. Quite the honor, right? Wouldn't you like a tablet named after you? This enormous tablet seems like it was made to last on purpose. It has three layers to it, which indicates it was definitely made by human hands or at least artificially made. So what is it made of? The first and thickest layer is like a sturdy cement or ceramic mix made from dolomite. Then there's the second layer, just one inch thick, made of diopside glass mixed with some silicon. The last layer is the thinnest, made from a mix of calcium and porcelain. According to ancient origins, this helped protect the stone and also created a diffused light effect to help illuminate the stone. This adds to the theory that it was made by some very advanced civilization why does the tablet have layers at all? Well, some think it's to protect it from damage. And hey, it did the trick, didn't it? I mean, it's ancient and it's in pretty good condition. Chuvirov explained how they were able to identify what the map was showing. With a team of experts in various fields, including cartography, physics, math, geology, they decoded the map identifying rivers and an important canyon like following breadcrumbs to confirm the accuracy of the tablet. Since it is so old, this means that the tectonic plates have shifted over the millions of years. Luckily for them, the landscape of present-day Bashkiria hasn't changed all that much, and they were able to identify the most important feature, which was Ufa Canyon. Okay, but some remain unconvinced, suggesting that these random cracks in the slab are just a coincidence. And what about the extreme date of 120 million years? This date comes from fossils of shells found in the rock. A more realistic date is that the tablet was made 3,000 years ago, which makes more sense and is still very old given all the detail and information in the map. The hieroglyphics have still not been deciphered, but could be ancient Chinese. So not only is there a map, but also a code to crack. So what do you think? Are all these lines just a coincidence? Or is this truly an ancient map? Or even a map of the creator? Let me know your thoughts. Big shout out to Randy Rosas and Nicholas Steele. What's up, guys? Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, you know what to do. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. Exploding Craters Sinkholes can be absolutely terrifying. Have you seen those videos of sinkholes just randomly opening up and swallowing a car or a whole building? I would hate to be around to witness the ground collapsing in on itself, but in Siberia, they have an even more frightening phenomenon, craters that explode. For over a decade, at least eight giant holes, each one about 160 feet deep and 65 feet wide, 
have opened up across Siberia. This occurrence has baffled scientists for years because they didn't know what was going on. But recently, they've developed a theory to explain how these things formed. These craters are only found in Russia's northern Yamal and Gaiden peninsulas and nowhere else in the Arctic. This suggests that the secret to solving this mystery might be hidden in the landscape itself. All sorts of ideas have been thrown around about what caused those monstrous holes. Some propose that meteor impacts could be to blame, while others suggest the craters could be the result of natural gas explosions. These craters might be appearing where old lakes once existed, with natural gas bubbling up from the permafrost underneath. These lakes could have dried up, which would have exposed the ground underneath to frigid temperatures that sealed off vents, preventing the gas from escaping. As a result, the gas would have been trapped in the permafrost, eventually being released by exploding through the surface, leaving these giant craters behind. But this last theory doesn't account for the variety of geological locations where these holes are found, many of which were never covered by lakes. The idea of natural gas accumulating within the permafrost also doesn't make the most sense. It doesn't explain why these craters are only found in northern Russia. So what's going on here? The icy ground throughout the Yamal and Gaiden peninsulas isn't all the same. It's like a crazy quilt, with some spots barely frozen and others solid as rock. The landscape also ranges in thickness, from just a few hundred feet to 1,600 feet. Now, to solve the mystery of these exploding craters, let's go back in time for a moment. More than 40,000 years ago, the ground in Siberia froze over, trapping ancient marine sediments loaded with methane gas. Over time, that trapped gas turned into huge reserves of natural gas. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. All that gas trapped beneath the surface is like a little furnace, heating things up and melting the ice from below. And this would cause pockets of gas to form at the bottom of these reserves. The icy ground in Russia and other places is also starting to melt, which may be speeding up the rate at which these craters are forming. And in places where the ice is already pretty thin, like on these peninsulas, it's like a double whammy, melting from the top and the bottom. Then add in all that gas pressure and boom! You've got a recipe for a permafrost party where the ground just might explode. The Charioteer In Siberia, where the frosty winds blow and the ground stays frozen for most of the year, a team of archaeologists set out on a quest that would unearth a fascinating piece of history. While excavating an ancient burial site, they stumbled upon the untouched grave of a person believed to be a charioteer. For over 3,000 years, this man was frozen in time. He was found in Caucasia, hidden beneath layers of earth and ice. But what made the discovery truly extraordinary was the presence of a peculiar artifact. Along with the man, they found a hooked metal attachment for a belt. It was intricately crafted and perfectly preserved. This unique find hinted at a fascinating aspect of ancient Siberian culture, the use of horse-drawn chariots. I can almost picture it now, brave charioteers racing across the icy tundra, their reins tied to their waist with these metal hooks. These hooks would have allowed them to steer their trusty steeds with precision and speed. Similar artifacts have been found in the distant lands of China and Mongolia, connecting Siberia to a vast network of ancient civilizations. Alexei Timoshenko, the lead archaeologist, marveled at the significance of their discovery. He explained to Live Science how the metal hook was found exactly where it should be, around the waist of the charioteer in the undisturbed grave. But the discovery didn't end there. As the team continued their excavations, they uncovered even more graves dating back thousands of years, each offering a glimpse into the lives of ancient Siberians. From bronze knives to intricate jewelry, the artifacts buried alongside the charioteer spoke of a rich and vibrant culture. Oleg Mitko, another archaeologist involved in the project, revealed that while similar belt hooks had been found before, their true purpose had remained a mystery. Until now. According to him, the charioteer's grave helped researchers understand why the artifact was important in ancient Siberian society. You know the saying, when one door closes, another opens, right? Well, it's like that with mysteries, too. Just when we thought we had one figured out, another one popped up. While we now have evidence suggesting that the ancient Siberians used chariots, no chariots have been found. We have the grave of the charioteer and his metal belt hook. But where's his chariot? 
Mammoth Tusk Tiara In Siberia's Denisova Cave, archaeologists stumbled upon an ancient tiara, you know, the tiara, crafted from tusks of long-extinct woolly mammoths. This unique headpiece, which is estimated to be between 35,000 and 50,000 years old, may be the oldest of its kind ever discovered in North Eurasia. Imagine the surprise uncovering something so rare, an artifact meticulously crafted by Paleolithic dwellers of the region. To make such an adornment, the ancient craftsmen would have followed a complex process, involving cutting, shaping, and polishing mammoth ivory into thin strips before making them into a headband. But what was the purpose of this tiara? Was it a symbol of royalty or simply a practical accessory for keeping hair in place? Similar headpieces found in other regions were adorned with intricate engravings, suggesting that whoever wore it had a special significance in ancient cultures. Archaeologists also uncovered other artifacts, like an ivory ring, a bone needle, and beads. The inhabitants of this cave likely had their own unique customs and traditions, but the details of their society are a bit fuzzy. The Denisova Cave is famous because it was where archaeologists first found the remains of an extinct human lineage called the Denisovans. They were like the cousins of Neanderthals. The ivory tiara was discovered in the same chamber where a 40,000-year-old adult tooth was found. The tooth belonged to one of these Denisovans, so it's likely that the tiara belonged to one of them as well. Giant Wolf's Head In the summer of 2018, a Russian man named Pavel Efimov made a horrifying discovery. While taking a stroll along the shores of a river in Siberia, he noticed something sticking out of the permafrost. When he got closer, he saw that it was the severed head of a wolf. And it wasn't just any old wolf either. The head was huge, complete with a full head of hair and a mouth filled with sharp fangs. Pavel didn't want to just leave it there for anyone to find. I mean, imagine a young child coming across this thing. That would be traumatic. So he decided to hand it over to local scientists. They dated the wolf's head to over 40,000 years old, near the end of the Pleistocene epoch. Scientists also determined that the wolf was fully grown when it died, between two and four years old. According to live science, the decapitated head is over a foot long, roughly half the size of a modern wolf's body. This means that this wolf must have been huge. This recently discovered head is the first of its kind dating back to the Pleistocene. It's incredibly preserved, giving researchers a chance to study it and learn more about this long extinct species. Other remains of ancient wolves have been found in the past, like the mummified wolf pup that was uncovered in Canada in 2016. And the year before that, Scientists analyzed the split between wolves and dogs by using DNA that was extracted from a 35,000-year-old wolf rib bone from Siberia. Currently, scientists from the Swedish Museum of Natural History are examining the DNA from this new wolf head, comparing its genetic information to that of modern-day wolves. After its initial discovery, the head was briefly on display as part of an exhibition in Tokyo, which also featured the remains of woolly mammoths and other frozen animals. As research continues, more questions may be answered. But the biggest question I have is where is the wolf's body? This guy was decapitated and whoever did it just left his head to freeze in the cold? We need more details! The Dancing Skeleton once you die, over time your body shrivels up and eventually there's nothing left but your bones. But surprisingly, bones can tell you a lot about a person. Let's take a look at this skeleton from Siberia that's been called the Dancing Skeleton. He was laid to rest in a position that made it seem like he was dancing into the afterlife. Archaeologists were amazed when they uncovered this man's grave in the village of Ust Ivanovka. The man was tied up, his feet were crossed, and his knees were wide open. His arms were also crossed around his pelvis. If this guy hadn't been tied up, his extremities would have straightened out on their own. So, the people who buried him in this way did so for a reason. Whoever this was, he died sometime between the 7th and 9th centuries. It's not exactly clear how he died, but there is evidence to suggest that he was shot with an arrow. The tips of arrows were placed on the man's shoulders, but they weren't lodged in the man's body when he was buried. They were likely removed and then put on his shoulders, maybe as part of some kind of ritual. There was also an arrow tip found near the man's hips, extremely close to the bone. And given the confusing placement of these arrowheads, that's why archaeologists think they had something to do with his death. There is a large and important artery in your pelvis. 
If Nectar severed, the blood loss from the injury would be extremely detrimental, possibly even fatal if not taken care of quickly. According to anthropologists, the man was fairly short, measuring no taller than five feet. Other graves were found nearby, but the dancing skeleton's grave was unique, laid out in a distinct rectangular pattern. All the others were more circular. The grave was also covered in white sand that doesn't appear to be local. Most of the other graves contained the bodies of elderly people, aged from 50 to 70 years old, but the dancing man was just 30 years old when he died. He is believed to have belonged to the Mohe culture of the Tungusic ethnic group, native to China, Mongolia, and of course, Siberia. But that's just one theory at the moment, as further tests are needed to be 100% certain. This group of people were farmers. They grew crops, raised animals, and likely bred pigs. They were fairly peaceful, but like other cultures, if it came down to it, they would defend themselves. That was made clear by the discovery of some fortification and armament buildings within the vicinity of the gravesite. But maybe this guy wasn't much of a dancer at all. The positioning of his legs could suggest that he suffered from a deformity or an illness, like syphilis or maybe tuberculosis. People with mutations and deformities during medieval times were often avoided like the plague. But that's just how it was back then. So what do you think? Dancer or an illness? Let me know what you think in the comments. Dragon buckles Belt buckles were all the rage hundreds of years ago. Back in the day, people would customize their belt buckles like people customize license plates today. Well, actually, we sort of customize everything today. Some of the most interesting buckles ever found were discovered in, you guessed it, Siberia. A tractor driver named Sergei Fevilov found the artifacts while he was plowing a field in the mid-1970s. At first, he thought the metallic pieces were just old tractor parts. But as he dug deeper, he uncovered something far more remarkable. Eight ancient belt buckles wrapped in birch bark. Little did Sergei know that he had unearthed a piece of ancient mythology from the modern-day Republic of Caucasia. These buckles, dating back to the end of the first millennium BC until the second century AD, reveal the existence of a unique creature, the Siberian dragon. You didn't think these were just going to be some boring, rusty belt buckles, did you? Unlike the well-known dragons of Chinese lore, the Siberian dragon boasted its own distinct features and symbolism. Archaeologists and researchers were astounded by the intricate dragon imagery depicted on the buckles. They showcased a mythical creature in a serpentine pose. This was a symbol of protection and good fortune for whoever wore it. It was a fashion trend, like the trends we see today. Crop tops, bell bottoms, you know. As experts delved deeper into the mystery, they uncovered fascinating connections between the Siberian dragon and ancient notions of calendars and astronomy. Nearby, in an area known as Sunduki, ancient astronomical observations were conducted at an observatory. A Chinese dictionary dating back to 200 AD says, On the day of spring equinox, the dragon flies to the sky. On the day of autumn equinox, it delves into abyss and covers in mud. Dr. Andrei Borodovsky from the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography noted the significance of the Siberian dragon in the region's cultural identity. He stated that while Siberia was under strong Chinese influence during this time, the dragon buckles were likely locally produced. This means that ancient Siberians had their own unique version of dragons. The dragon's legacy, however, eventually faded away. It was replaced by copies of the more familiar Chinese dragons with their zigzag movements. But still, the discovery of these buckles is exciting. Thanks to the tractor driver, we now know more about Siberia's ancient mythology and cultural heritage. Zombie in the Ice Imagine waking up after 24,000 years of nap time. That's what happened to a tiny but mighty creature called the Bedeloid rotifer. Found frozen in Siberia, this microscopic critter emerged from its icy slumber, ready to party. It's basically a zombie, but way cuter. B. rotifer is no ordinary microorganism. It's smaller than a speck of dust, measuring just a few micrometers in length. For comparison, that's tinier than the thickness of a piece of paper. Despite its size, this tiny titan can do things that us humans can only ever dream of. It can clone itself multiple times without needing a partner, a trick called parthenogenesis. Discovered by scientists in Russia, this rotifer's resurrection raises questions about how life can hang on for so long in the freezer. The soil where it was found has been frozen for millennia, 
dating back to the time when mammoths roamed the earth and humans were still figuring out how to make fire. So how did this little guy survive all that time? The permafrost acted like a natural freezer, preserving it like you see in movies when someone enters cryosleep for hundreds or even thousands of years. Scientists think that creatures like this rotifer might have been trapped in the ice long ago, only emerging recently in January of 2024. The discovery has researchers buzzing with excitement. It's like finding a long-lost treasure buried in your backyard. While the rotifer's comeback is impressive, it's just the tip of the iceberg, or the permafrost in this case. Other frozen wonders from prehistoric worms to woolly rhinos have also thawed out and surprised scientists in recent years. Who knows what other ancient secrets are hiding beneath the ice? Siberia's Mystery Fort There is a mysterious fortress in Siberia that looks like it came straight out of a fantasy novel. Its crumbling walls sit on a massive rectangular space on an island in the middle of a lake, but nobody really knows who built it or why. The story of poor Bazin dates back over 1,000 years, to a time when Siberia was a wild and untamed land. It still kind of is. With its mighty walls and sprawling layout, the ruins of the fortress stand as a testament to the mysterious past of this remote region. Over the centuries, Por Bazin has puzzled archaeologists and historians alike. Some believe it was built to defend against invaders, while others think it may have been a sacred site for pilgrims. So what's the truth? The truth is, nobody knows. In the late 1800s, explorers set foot on the island and tried to unravel its secrets. They discovered that it was built using ancient Chinese techniques, hinting at a connection to distant lands and cultures. It could have been a place of great religious significance, perhaps housing monks, which would explain its extreme isolation. When examining old paintings from the Tang Dynasty, the shape of the ruins looks a lot like palaces and Buddhist ideas of paradise. However, Buddhism wasn't the main religion in that area back then, so it's unclear who sponsored the construction of the fortress. As the years passed, more clues emerged. Radiocarbon dating revealed construction began in 777, during a time of great upheaval. But even with this new information, the true purpose of Por Bazin remains a mystery. In 2007, a team of scientists embarked on an expedition to excavate Por Bazin and uncovered secrets once and for all. But what they found only added to the mystery. They found evidence of earthquakes and fires that pointed towards a violent end for the fortress. But the final nail in the coffin is still poorly understood. Today, Por Bazin stands in shambles as a vigilant guardian, protecting the site's secrets from prying eyes. Despite centuries of study and speculation, the true purpose of this ancient fortress remains a question mark on Siberia's map. But perhaps one day, its walls will finally reveal the truth. Until then, it remains one of Siberia's greatest mysteries. The Crystal Meteorite when it comes to scientific discoveries, there are few tales as captivating as the saga of the quasi-crystal. It's a tiny but mighty meteorite that emerged from the depths of space to challenge our understanding of the universe itself. Our story begins in 2009, with the halls of the Italian Museum of Natural History in Florence. Here, a group of scientists stumbled upon a small grain of an extraterrestrial mineral that was stored in a box. Little did they know that this unassuming find would lead them on a journey spanning continents and millennia, unraveling the mysteries of our solar system's distant past. This celestial gem hailed from the remote reaches of eastern Siberia, near the imposing Koryak Mountains. Dubbed the Katirka meteorite, it bore witness to the tumultuous birth of our solar system some 4.5 billion years ago. Hidden within the meteorite was something truly mind-blowing a discovery that shook the scientific world to its core. It was the revelation that quasi-crystals exist. This finding was a big deal, like finding out that aliens are real, but in rock form. Now you might be wondering, what is a quasi-crystal? It's like a crystal with its typical orderly arrangement of atoms stretching out in a symmetrical grid. But now imagine that same crystal with a twist. Quasi-crystals are all over the place, zigging and zagging in unexpected ways. Quasi-crystals are like the rock stars of the mineral world, flaunting shapes and configurations never before seen in nature. Simply put, quasi-crystals defy the conventions of traditional mineralogy. 
For decades, scientists believed that such exotic forms of matter were nothing more than theoretical pipe dreams. That is, until the discovery of the Katirka quasi-crystal shattered those ideas, like shards of crystal. Paul Steinhardt was the visionary physicist from Princeton University who spearheaded the quasi-crystal quest. With the help of Italian geologist Luca Bindi, Steinhardt assembled a team of scientists to scrutinize this celestial oddity. Together, they delved deep into the heart of the quasi-crystal, unlocking its secrets one atomic layer at a time. So what did they find? Not only did they confirm the quasi-crystal's extraterrestrial origins, but they also unearthed clues about its cosmic journey. Embedded within a mineral called stichovite, the quasi-crystal contained the unmistakable signature of its meteoric birth, forged in the crucible of interstellar collisions eons ago. Fueled by their insatiable thirst for knowledge, Steinhardt and his comrades set out on an expedition to Siberia in 2011. Armed with pickaxes and a sense of scientific adventure, they searched the Kamchatka Peninsula in search of more quasi-crystals. And lo and behold, they found what they were looking for. Not one, not two, but three quasi-crystals were found nestled within the rocky embrace of the Katirka meteorite, each one showcasing the cosmic creativity that shapes our universe. With their unique molecular structures and mysterious origins, these celestial gems opened a window into the ancient history of our solar system. The Mystery Cave Antarctica is the least populated continent in the world. It's an enormous landmass that is home to the South Pole and a handful of abandoned bases left behind by explorers. Antarctica is bigger than Europe and is almost twice the size of Australia. It's also covered in ice that's typically about one mile thick. Additionally, the frigid continent appears to be home to a strange and mysterious cavern. All kinds of bizarre things have been found in Antarctica thanks to satellite images, from what appear to be the ruins of a lost civilization to crashed spaceships. But because of the continent's remoteness, a lot of these so-called discoveries have been impossible to prove. The most recent unusual find is that of a black cavern hiding in an ice sheet on King George Island. An image of the entrance to the cave recently appeared online, but what's inside of it? Who created it? And what secrets could it be hiding? Unfortunately, scientists aren't really sure. Some have speculated the dark portal is the entrance to a subterranean cave system, hiding beneath the continent itself. Just like so many of the other crazy alleged discoveries, there is no way for anyone to go and check this cave out. You can't exactly take a ferry to Antarctica and go exploring. And for for that reason, all we have is speculation. Could this be the entrance to a tunnel that leads to a lost world covered in ice? For the time being, we just don't know. What do you think is inside the cave? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The Buash Map the Buash map is believed to be evidence that Antarctica was once home to a mysterious civilization. The map was drawn around 1739 by a French geographer named Philippe Buash de la Neuville. Philippe made a map of the known southern lands below the Tropic of Capricorn and the Cape of Good Hope. What is so unusual about the map, made before the official discovery of Antarctica, is that it shows the subglacial topography of the continent. Before Antarctica was ever found, this map seems to show what it looked like without it being covered in ice. It's baffled researchers for decades. Nobody understands how an ordinary French explorer could have possibly known about Antarctica. There are a few explanations to make sense of the map. Those who want to look at it from a more scientific view believe Philippe was hypothesizing a land at the bottom of the world. Because he never imagined such a land would be covered in ice, he drew the landmass normally. Those with more active imaginations have suggested Philippe copied an even older map made by an unknown party, an ancient map of Antarctica before it was ever frozen. Huge shout out to Andrew Federal for the super thanks! We wouldn't be here without support from viewers like you. If you are new to the channel, welcome! And be sure to subscribe! The crater. A meteorite smashed into Antarctica 250 million years ago. The crater it left behind was discovered by an international team of researchers. They used two satellites to pinpoint the exact location of the impact. What they found was staggering. It looks like the impact crater might be the largest of its kind on our planet, an estimated 300 miles long and hidden underneath nearly a mile of solid ice. The discovery of the crater goes back to 2006. NASA and the 
German Aerospace Center work together to measure anomalies in the gravitational field. Their instruments picked up an anomaly in the area of Wilkes Land. Then, in 2018, they used new and improved satellite technology to confirm their suspicions. The impact made by the meteorite would have been devastating for life on Earth. The space rock would have caused an explosion of immense magnitude. Huge amounts of dust would have been pushed into the air, resulting in months of darkness and likely toxic rain. The entire planet would have turned into a raging inferno, a kind of planetary hellscape. Researchers believe that only a handful of shellfish survived the destruction. These shellfish were likely the early ancestors of dinosaurs, who began to take shape about 50 million years after the impact. According to Michael J. Benton from the University of Bristol, the crater could have eliminated about 90% of all life on Earth, the volcanoes of Antarctica. When you think about Antarctica, you likely imagine a desolate wasteland of ice and snow. But the truth is that Antarctica is a volatile land of volcanoes and potential annihilation. Scientists recently revealed just how dangerous Antarctica could be for the rest of the world. They discovered the scope of the icy continent's volcanoes, and unfortunately, it's not looking good. Hiding underneath all the snow and ice are very real mountains of fire and brimstone that could erupt at any moment, melting the ice and causing global oceans to surge to apocalyptic levels. Scientists have always known that Antarctica is home to multiple volcanoes, but nobody could ever agree on where the source of volcanic activity was coming from. But now, a team of scientists identified a location where heat is swelling in the Earth's mantle. This heat source is similar to the heat source that powers the Yellowstone volcano and the volcanoes of the Hawaiian Islands. It's deep underground, but we now know that it's there. The mantle plume, known as the Mary Birdland, appears to be the heat source contributing to Antarctica's volcanic activity. But what does this mean for the future of Antarctica? As scary as it sounds, it likely isn't a huge deal. Researchers believe the volcanic source came into being over 50 million years ago. And since Antarctica has been frozen for most of that time, it clearly hasn't caused a problem with the ice. But if there ever is an eruption, it could be huge and catastrophic. The Strange Monsters of Antarctica Researchers in Antarctica recently made a shocking breakthrough when they discovered the remains of monsters that lived 250 million years ago. Not just a few monsters either, but a lot of them. As you may know already, Antarctica is primarily home to scientists. There are about 1,000 researchers living in Antarctica at any given time, each one trying to understand the history of the planet. One of those scientists is Christian Sidor from the Burke Museum, who traveled to Antarctica to conduct his own research. He and his team were searching for fossils to document what the wildlife looked like here in the prehistoric past. So they spent about two months uncovering the remains of creatures from a bygone age. They found fossils belonging to relatives of amphibians, ancient mammal relatives, and streaked reptilian-like critters. One of the biggest shocks was that they found evidence of burrowing creatures, monsters that dug underground dens during the Triassic era. The conclusion of the study was a big deal for paleontologists. Experts have always known that there were dinosaurs living on the Antarctic continent, but nobody has ever known the full extent of it. The sheer variety of animal remains that have been found on the frigid continent have proven that even at the bottom of the world, it was once warm and balmy enough to support a myriad of life. At one point in time, there were dinosaurs, swampy amphibians like prehistoric frogs, and all kinds of beasts roaming throughout Antarctica. Considering the remains of these creatures are still frozen under over a mile of ice, researchers are hopeful that future excavations will yield even more incredible results. What other bizarre creatures do you think lived in Antarctica in the prehistoric past? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Crustal Displacement There might be a secret city frozen underneath the Antarctic ice. Maybe not just one city either, but the ruins of an entire civilization that's been lost for thousands of years. It's a big claim, but where is the evidence to back it up? One of the scientific theories that supports a civilization living here is called crustal displacement. The theory, which hasn't been proven, alleges the Earth's crust shifted 12,000 years ago. Prior to the crust shifting, huge parts of Antarctica were much farther north 
north in a warmer climate where they weren't covered in ice. Then, when the crust shifted, the ice-free landmass wound up at the bottom of the world, and the civilization that was living there at the time was forced to abandon their cities due to the terrifying cold. What's really interesting about this theory is that the dates line up perfectly with Plato's description of Atlantis. In 360 BC, the famous Greek philosopher claimed Atlantis was destroyed around 9000 BC. That would be 11,000 years before today, around the same era that the crust allegedly shifted. If there truly was a city in Antarctica, and if it was Atlantis, it would still be buried under countless tons of ice. We likely won't find any evidence of it, assuming it exists, until more surface ice has melted. But do you really believe an ancient civilization occupied the now-frozen continent? Let me know in the comments! Admiral Byrd's Expedition some very unusual photographs have been making the rounds online. Images supposedly taken during Admiral Byrd's famous Antarctic expedition are currently being shared on social media. In these photographs, there's supposedly proof of the lost civilization witnessed by the Admiral and nobody else. But who was Admiral Byrd? He was a real U.S. Navy officer who went on multiple expeditions to Antarctica between 1928 and 1956. All of his expeditions were recorded in great detail and so we know all the scientific facts he collected. There aren't any official details about a secret civilization being found. However, his expeditions have been closely linked to the Hollow Earth theory. According to the theory, the Admiral came upon the entrance to a secret world hidden beneath our own. This kind of shadow world is said to live underneath the surface of the Earth. Imagine if the planet was hollow, and on the flip side of the outer shell was another civilization. Then, in the center of the planet, there was a sun or some other type of light source, allowing for strange and unusual life forms to flourish. It seems crazy, but it's been a popular theory for a few hundred years. Admiral Byrd was supposedly the one man to find the entrance to the hollow Earth. Sadly, the pictures currently floating around were almost definitely generated by AI, not taken by Admiral Byrd or his crew. Still, that doesn't mean the Admiral didn't find something strange in Antarctica. The Discovery Hut there is a lonely wooden hut in the snowy fields of Antarctica that nobody has lived in for a very long time. It's called the Discovery Hut, and it's a ruin from the heroic age of polar exploration. Between 1897 and 1922, brave explorers from all across the globe were desperate to be the first ones to explore and map Antarctica. As a result, these adventurers left shoddy wooden cabins and huts all along the coastline. This one is at a place called Hut Point, near McMurray. Station. It was built on Ross Island in 1902 by British explorers hoping to claim Antarctica for themselves. The brightest minds in Britain were charged with the task of designing a suitable habitat for the frigid Antarctic conditions. But these supposedly brilliant minds had never spent much time in the snow, and so the whole project was a total failure. The design for the hut was given to a company in Australia and was prefabricated in pieces. These pieces were then taken to Antarctica and assembled at the intended location, but there wasn't enough insulation. The wooden planks weren't as strong as they should have been, and the wind ripped right through the structure. The roof wasn't even designed in a way that the snow could easily slide off. The structure was a nightmare that nobody could live with, but there wasn't much they could do with it. They weren't about to pack the building up and take it home, so it's still sitting where it was originally constructed, almost entirely buried in snow. Would you be brave enough to go live in Antarctica for a while? Let me know in the comments! Club 90 South Bar There is a bar at the South Pole one of the coldest watering holes on the planet. It's called Club 90 South Bar, and its story is fascinating. What a lot of people don't realize about past explorers is that they love to drink. Most expeditions didn't go anywhere without a solid supply of booze. Ferdinand Magellan refused to sail without ample wine and sherry. Ernest Shackleton even stocked his ships with enough whiskey to last his whole crew three years. Apparently, modern Antarctic explorers still enjoy alcohol. 
The thousands of scientists who rotate in and out of the icy continent still like to have a drink every once in a while. Club 90 South is only one of many bars servicing the almost 50 scientific stations in Antarctica. Almost every station has its own bar, its own bartender, and its own supply of beverages to keep the scientists from going completely insane. In the case of Club 90 South, nobody owns the bar and nobody pays for the booze. People simply share supplies and make sure the alcohol never runs dry. The Emperor Penguin The biggest penguin in the world is the Emperor Penguin, discovered by Antarctic explorers in the 18th century. The Emperor Penguin's scientific name is Aptenodites forsteri, named after Johann Reinhold Forster. Johann was the naturalist who sailed with James Cook on his second voyage to the Southern Ocean between 1772 and 1775. A naturalist was what they used to call scientists who studied natural life, long before they were called biologists or zoologists. Historians believe Johann was the first human being to ever lay eyes on the emperor penguin. We know this because he mistakenly identified it as the king penguin. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that Edward Wilson discovered the first breeding colony of emperor penguins. He was on the discovery expedition to Ross Island, which set sail in 1901 for Antarctica. He developed a fascination with the animals when he found them breeding on sea ice. Edward speculated that the eggs likely hatched during the coldest months of the year, behavior that's very unusual for a bird. He became obsessed with penguins during his visit, loitering around the colony. He learned very quickly that chicks appeared to have a mortality rate of almost 70%, meaning that only 3 out of 10 chicks survived. These days, we know a whole lot more about emperor penguins. They love the cold, and their eggs really do hatch in the most extreme parts of winter. They also have a pretty cushy life eating fish, krill, and squid. They mate in pairs, and the female lays a single egg. If the chick survives, they can grow to nearly 90 pounds. The male also typically raises the baby after it's hatched, while the female leaves to go and find food. The Apocalypse Volcano while you may not think it because of all the ice and snow, Alaska is home to some of the most volatile volcanoes on the planet. Scientists recently revealed what they believe to be a supervolcano hiding underneath the Aleutian Islands in southwestern Alaska. What's really amazing is that the supervolcano was only discovered because of a bizarre game of connect the dots. Scientists with the U.S. Geological Survey's Alaska Volcano Observatory were looking at six existing volcanoes when they realized each one might be part of a larger supervolcano. All four existing volcanoes, which scientists already knew about, are connected inside a massive crater. The crater was likely created when the original volcano of massive proportions exploded. John Power, one of the geophysicists doing the investigation, said the volcano would likely disrupt civilizations across the globe if it erupted at any time in human history. The discovery hasn't been 100% verified yet, but it appears as though we may have a giant volcano right below the ice of Alaska. Scientists think the caldera of the supervolcano, meaning its mouth, is nearly 15 miles across. It doesn't look like it's about to explode at any point in the near future, but it's definitely something that could happen. And if it were to happen, the resulting fallout could wipe out human civilization. Alaska's Underground Pyramid There is supposedly a huge pyramid hiding in Alaska. This mysterious pyramid is said to be the biggest in the world, and yet nobody has ever heard of it. But apparently in May of 1992, China was conducting an underground nuclear test in their northern desert. Scientists using seismographic equipment to analyze the Earth's crust picked up a strange reading from Alaska, which isn't all that far from eastern China. There seemed to be a pyramid-shaped structure somewhere near Mount McKinley, buried deep in the Earth. This strange and astounding monument became known as the Black Pyramid. However, most mainstream scientists don't think it exists at all. Unfortunately, there is no verifiable proof that Chinese scientists ever found a pyramid hiding in Alaska. We have the story of how it supposedly happened, but no concrete evidence to support the claim. Furthermore, we have people who believe the U.S. government knew about the pyramid long before China ever found it, 
and went through enormous lengths to conceal it. And some locals near Mount McKinley have made reports of bizarre electrical energy emanating from underneath the ground. If these tales are to be believed, somewhere underneath Alaska is an ancient pyramid emitting intense energy, and it's been completely covered up by the government. Any people who live in Alaska out there? Or have you ever been? Let me know in the comments! I'm planning a trip in September! Big shout out to Paige Nichols and Eric Sean Wolf. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained! We wouldn't be here without you! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family! The Alaskan Hairy Man There are creatures that supposedly live in southwestern Alaska called Urayuli. Some think there are entire families of these things that exist in the frigid continent, while others believe there might just be one like the legendary Sasquatch. According to the myth, the creature, or creatures, are very similar to Bigfoot. They are ape-like and stand about 10 feet tall from head to toe. They are also covered in shaggy fur and have glowing eyes that can be seen on the darkest of nights. They are said to emit sharp cries like the call of a loon, and their arms are so long that their knuckles drag on the ground when they walk. They allegedly live all throughout the wild area of Lake Iliamna, and unlike most mythical beasts, the Urayuli are peaceful creatures. Well, that's good. Surprisingly, the Urayuli aren't the only hairy monsters that are supposedly hiding in the wilderness of Alaska. There is also a creature that's been nicknamed the Alaskan Hairy Man. The big difference between the Urayuli and the Hairy Man is that the latter is described as being aggressive. While the Urayuli try to avoid human contact and generally keep to themselves, the Hairy Man isn't afraid to attack. And while both of these cryptids are about as likely to exist as Bigfoot, there have been some shocking sightings in the past. In April 2013, a woman working in Napakiak village supposedly saw the hairy man while gazing out her window in the early afternoon. The worker saw something extremely tall walk across the bluff on the other side of the village, striding on two legs and covered in dark fur. The eyewitness said that she'd seen people walking on the block before and that this definitely wasn't a human. The creature then moved to the lower part of the bluff and vanished. Afterward, the woman gathered a group of eight people, hoping the monster would return. And sure enough, it moved back within view and shuffled around on the bluff for a minute before disappearing once again. Amazingly, everybody in the group claimed to see it. There were even kids playing outside who saw the giant hairy creature and went screaming in the other direction. We'll most likely never be able to verify that what was seen that day was indeed the Alaskan version of Bigfoot. But there's always a chance. The Lost Fortress Archaeologists recently found the remains of a lost 19th century fort in Alaska. This ancient fortress that was nearly forgotten about was the place of an epic battle between indigenous Alaskan clans and ruthless Russian soldiers. This fort was a stronghold for the indigenous group known as the Tlingit. It was the last stronghold for native Alaskans before Russia pushed past them with brutality and colonized Alaska in 1804. This was the beginning of 60 years of occupation and subjugation, a rather dark time in the continent's history. The terrible truth is that Russia invaded Alaska in 1799. For three years, the Tlingit fought back against the colonizers. They fortified territory, built wooden fortresses, and desperately waged war. Their most impressive fortress was called Shizgi Nu, and although it held strong for a short while, it didn't last very long. Russians had the numbers and the technology, and they destroyed the fortress and all those who lived inside it. For the past 200 years, Shisky Nu has been nothing but a story in history books. But finally, a team of specialists working with Cornell University in Ithaca and Shenandoah National Park in Virginia have made some headway. They used ground-penetrating radar to identify the structural remains of the destroyed fortress. They now have its exact location, although there really isn't anything left of it. Nothing but old timbers buried deep within the ground, and the ugly stain of Russia's colonialism remains. 
Still, the ruin is one of the most important cultural symbols of the Tlingit resistance. The Alaskan Vortex Alaska is twice the size of Texas and home to 17 out of the 20 highest peaks in the United States. Over half of the federally designated wilderness in the USA also happens to be in Alaska. It's really difficult to express just how large the icy continent is. So, it may come as no surprise that there is a rather large stretch of wilderness in which people are continuously vanishing without a trace. There have been an estimated 16,000 disappearances inside the Alaska Triangle, the most famous of which is the disappearance of Congressman Hale Bogg in 1972. Bogg vanished in a private aircraft while flying over the Alaska Triangle and was never seen again. They looked for him for 39 days before finally giving up, and to this day, his plane has never been found. And that's only one example out of 16,000. We still don't know what causes all the disappearances in the Alaska Triangle. There are a lot of theories, though, including one about aliens. In 1986, the FAA released a report about unidentified flying objects. Japan Airlines Flight 1628 encountered three unexplainable flying objects in the sky. Some believe it's aliens who are kidnapping people from this area. Another theory is that the triangle is home to swirling energy vortexes that dramatically alter human behavior. Electronic readings have found anomalies with magnetic energies in this area. Compasses can supposedly stop functioning altogether or simply malfunction typically resulting in people getting lost. Some volunteers who have helped search for the missing have even reported experiencing distortions and hallucinations, all because of the energy vortex. World War II Battleship A ship was destroyed off the coast of Alaska near the Aleutian Islands 75 years ago. It was the USS Abner Reed, a vessel that was patrolling the waters during the height of World War II. On August 18, 1943, the patrol ship was likely hit by a Japanese mine. The Abner stern was totally obliterated, but somehow the crew managed to keep water out of the main area. In the end, two Navy ships hauled the destroyer back to safety. Sam Cox from the Naval History and Heritage Command says the damage was catastrophic and that the ship should have sunk. Instead, it was fixed and went to fight more battles against the Japanese. It was finally sunk for real in November of 1944, but the ship's stern was never found. That is, until now. Scientists with the University of California, San Diego used multi-beam sonar to scan the ocean floor looking for the chunk of the destroyed ship. And amazingly, they found it. The team even captured video of the ship using a remotely controlled vehicle at 290 feet under the Bering Sea. The shipwreck, however, isn't in great shape. It's almost entirely rusted and covered in sea slime. But it's there, a lost piece of World War II hiding in the unassuming waters of Alaska. The Eskimo Massacre Site Archaeologists in Alaska recently discovered the remains of 28 villagers who were part of a brutal massacre 350 years ago. The most terrible part about the discovery is that up until now, the massacre was simply an old folk tale. It was a story from the local lore of the Eskimos, who are also called the Yup'ik. But now archaeologists have proof that the tragic tale is somewhat grounded in reality. Researchers with the University of Aberdeen excavated Aga Ligmute, an old village in Alaska that once belonged to the Eskimos. It was there that they found the remains of people who had been tied with grass rope and shoved face down in the ground before being executed. Many bodies had injuries that were likely caused by taking a spear to the back of the skull or by being pierced by an arrow. Dr. Rick Necht said most of the human remains were women, children, and elderly people there was only a single man found within the group who was of fighting age. Based on the evidence, researchers believe the villagers were tortured and murdered. Then they had their village burned down and erased from history. It looks like the village was attacked by enemies when all of the young men or warriors were away. The archaeological proof isn't far off from the legend. 
According to the tale, the massacre happened because of a dart game that went wrong. A pair of indigenous tribes were already having a conflict, but that disagreement was pushed over the edge by a botched dart game when one of the participants took a dart to the eyeball. This resulted in the massacre, which occurred sometime around 1652. Mind Control Mayhem There could be a laboratory in Alaska where the government is trying to figure out how to master mind control. It's called the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP for short. The facility is home to one of the most powerful transmitter arrays in the world. The official story is that the facility is used for studying the upper reaches of our atmosphere. Scientists use highly advanced instruments to detect things going on way above our heads, literally. But not everybody is so easily convinced. Seeing as the facility is nestled in the remote mountains over 250 miles from Fairbanks, it seems like the perfect place for a secret government lab. It's been blamed for causing earthquakes, for destroying the space shuttle Columbia, and much more. Conspiracy theorists say HARP is experimenting with controlling the weather, turning the weather into a weapon of war. It's also believed that those involved in HARP are dabbling in mind control. It doesn't help the facility's reputation that it was built as part of a joint project with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. After all, what would DARPA be interested in studying the upper atmosphere for when their primary objective is to create weapons? Probably because they're creating weapons for outer space. But what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe. Alien Hysteria A cloud was recently spotted over Alaska and it turned into a massive controversy. The cloud was so strange and suspicious that it spawned a police investigation and lit up social media. The cloud, which looked a lot like a narrow column of smoke, was seen floating over Lazy Mountain on a chilly day in April 2022. Just minutes after the cloud was spotted, people began speculating over what it was. Some believed it was the smoke debris from a hypersonic missile test, while others said it was aliens. It's not every day a cloud gets this much attention. The issue was that the cloud looked solid and that it was shaped like a long cylinder with what appeared to be a metallic claw at its end. In all honesty, it resembled an alien spaceship trying to disguise itself as a cloud. Due to the hysteria surrounding the strange cloud, local police got involved. Alaska state troopers told the public that what they saw was nothing but an airplane's contrail combined with the light of a brilliant sunrise. The contrail mixed with the rising sun caused it to appear far more menacing than it really was. But this explanation did little to ease the minds of locals. The Alaska state troopers were eventually forced to send out a helicopter crew to investigate the cloud after receiving numerous calls from the public. They never found any alien bodies or spaceships, but that doesn't necessarily mean the cloud was natural. The conclusion reached by the authorities could have just been a big cover-up. But unfortunately, we may never know for sure. King Bear in Inuit mythology, there is a story about a creature called King Bear, or Tiriarnak in the local language. Hunters from Canada's Western Arctic, even today, tell stories about a terrifying bear unlike any other. Now, keep in mind these hunters have been tracking down and killing polar bears for centuries, so they've seen every kind of Arctic bear imaginable. But the King Bear is bigger and scarier than all the rest. It's enormous, and it supposedly moves like a demon. And it's so ferocious that it can kill an entire hunting party. Up until very recently, most anthropologists simply thought this was a story. But now, archaeologists have found a skull in Alaska that could prove the king bear was a real beast. Researchers found what they have described as an elongated polar bear skull. It was uncovered way out in the Alaskan wilderness. The leader of the excavation, Ann Jensen, says it's one of the biggest polar bear skulls ever found. But it could also be from a different species, since it's a little more slender and has uncommon structural features. The skull was dated to be about 1,200 years old. All these clues suggest the king bear was a real rampaging animal that terrified the Inuit. 
Either it's still out there in the Alaskan wild somewhere, or it went extinct in the past couple centuries. The Baba Vanga Prediction French scientists revived a zombie virus from 48,500 years ago. They uncovered the virus underneath a frozen lake in Russia. A huge amount of permafrost melted because of global warming, leading to the discovery of the virus that had never been seen by modern humans before. However, this wasn't the only time a virus was unleashed from its slumber under the ice. In the frigid Yakutia region of Siberia, lots of awful discoveries have been made. A 30,000-year-old virus was identified by scientists in 2013. Researcher Jean-Michel Clavery was quoted saying, Every time we look, we will find a virus. It's become apparent that as the ice continues to melt in frozen places like Siberia, more viruses will be released into the world. Scientists say the risks are worth monitoring. Coronaviruses, just like the one that causes COVID-19, have the ability to survive even if they are frozen for a long time. Even smallpox can survive in sub-zero temperatures and reinfect people later on. Some are terrified that over the next few years, one of these viruses will be released from the permafrost in Russia, starting another global pandemic. Interestingly, the Bulgarian oracle known as Baba Vanga predicted a frozen virus would be discovered. She reportedly predicted that in 2022, researchers would discover a lethal virus in Siberia that was frozen. She even said that because of the catastrophic effects of global warming, the virus could spin out of control when released. It's pretty crazy to think a blind Bulgarian mystic woman could have predicted such a virus being found in the correct location almost a century ago. The Sunstorm A solar storm ravaged our planet 2,600 years ago. The storm was roughly 10 times more powerful than any storm modern scientists have recorded. It was so strong that if it happened today, it could wreak unprecedented havoc on our global world. The only reason we know about this shocking sunstorm is because of data that was gathered by scientists investigating ice samples. Researchers uncovered radioactive atoms trapped inside the ice in Greenland. They looked at a pair of ice core samples and saw a huge spike in the material called radioactive beryllium-10 and chlorine-36 roughly 2,610 years ago. Similar findings have been found in ancient trees with a spike of carbon-14. All clues point to an ancient sunstorm taking place around 660 BC. These storms occur when the sun bombards our planet with highly energetic particles. These particles smash into the magnetosphere that covers our planet, an invisible protective shell of electrically charged particles. One of these storms happened in 1989, and it caused the entire Canadian province of Quebec to go dark. Transformers as far as New Jersey were damaged, almost shutting down the power grid along the mid-Atlantic and into the Pacific Northwest. And that was just a baby storm. The one that happened 2,600 years ago was so much stronger that if it happened today, it could wipe out every grid on the planet. The scariest part about this is that scientists say it could happen at any second without warning. What do you think would happen if a sudden storm wiped out every power grid on the planet? Let me know in the comments. As if we didn't have enough to worry about. The Devil's Cemetery the Devil's Cemetery in Russia is a strange and mystical place. In the middle of a vast forest found in the frigid wasteland of Siberia is a clearing. It's an open area without a single tree growing inside it, where the land appears dead and infertile. No animals live within the clear patch, and some say they experience nausea and dizziness when they enter it. At its edges are mysterious wooden statues constructed by past generations that wanted to warn travelers to stay away. Locals have blamed the empty patch of land on demons, saying it's the grave of some evil entity. In the 1990s, people started saying the patch was made by a UFO that landed in the forest and burned all the trees down. But what really caused this patch of empty land to appear in the middle of a snowy Russian forest? The truth is that nobody knows. All we have are speculations and conspiracy theories. Some say that between 1980 and 1990, over 75 people perished while trying to study the meadow, although these numbers have never been confirmed. 
Some scientists have guessed the Devil's Cemetery may have been created by a supersonic explosion when a space rock burst through the atmosphere like an atomic bomb. Russia's Death Valley the Kamchatka Peninsula can be found in the farthest eastern reaches of Russia. It's a frozen volcanic wasteland, a chain of erupting mountains completely covered in snow. Every once in a while, one of the volcanoes will explode and rain fire onto the land, but most of the time, everything is frozen. This place is located in a narrow, unsuspecting canyon, and the 1.2-mile-long stretch of land is named the Valley of Death. It's infamous for killing almost everything that goes into it, and for a long time, scientists didn't understand what was going on. During the heat of summer when some of the ice would melt, the skeletons of dead animals could be found all along the valley floor. Creatures like birds, foxes, bears, and even eagles who descended into the valley simply perished. It wasn't until 1975 that scientist Vladimir Leonov realized the valley is most likely filled with carbon dioxide. And as you might know already, too much carbon dioxide in a confined space can cause deaths. But there are other mysteries in Death Valley as well. Locals have been telling tales about the place for centuries. They say that frozen underneath the solid ice are giant pots that were buried hundreds of years ago. The valley floor supposedly hides massive metal cauldrons beneath it. There have even been bizarre sightings of giants walking through the valley. Explorers and researchers have tried in vain to uncover the mysterious pots buried in the valley, but nobody's ever had any luck. That we know of. The Iceman in 1991, a group of hikers stumbled upon the frozen remains of a Stone Age human inside a melting glacier along the border of Austria and Italy. This was the closest we've ever come to finding a caveman frozen in a block of ice. The caveman was named Otzi the Iceman, and his discovery led to several other revelations, including what life was like 5,300 years ago. The general hypothesis regarding how Otzi got into the mountain is that he fled after being brutally attacked by someone or something. He tried to escape through the mountain passes, but instead he froze to death. For over 5,000 years, he and his tools sat abandoned beneath the ice and snow. But not all of this may be true. A recent study has revealed that Otzi the Iceman likely thawed and froze again multiple times. Scientists say he wasn't always stuck in a block of ice, but was thawed out repeatedly when the weather changed and warmed up the mountains. Even if this is true, it doesn't change all the amazing discoveries we've made thanks to Otzi, like finding out Copper Age people were covered in tattoos, or that they wore clothing made from domesticated cattle. However, it does suggest that somewhere on a mountain glacier is another ice man or ice woman waiting to be uncovered. It's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to James Meeks and Bjorn Damrong for supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. We'd love to have you! The Ghost Islands of the Arctic in 2021, scientists off the coast of Greenland discovered an uncharted island. It was small and covered in ice, and scientists initially thought it was the northernmost island in the world. However, over the decades, other islands were discovered in the same region, which created some confusion among explorers. But many of the islands that were found mysteriously disappeared. At first, scientists had a hard time with ghost islands in the Arctic, and nobody could figure out if these were real islands or just rocky banks that were pushed up by sea ice. But the mystery was solved when a team of Swiss and Danish scientists traveled to the Arctic to investigate the ghost islands. What they discovered wasn't what anyone had expected. The elusive islands that appear and disappear are in fact icebergs that have gotten stuck to the bottom of the sea. They likely originated from glaciers and got covered in gravel before getting stuck. This made them look like islands instead of floating pieces of ice. Biblical Truths Mount Kilimanjaro is located in East Africa and is most frequently accessed inside the Kilimanjaro Park in Tanzania. Although the country is mostly hot and humid, the peak of the mountain has been covered in ice for hundreds of years. But Mount Kilimanjaro isn't a mountain at all. It's really a volcano, one that hasn't erupted in about 200,000 years. Since its tallest peak is 19,000 feet, it isn't hard to understand why its highest point is so cold and snowy. 
On the sides of the mountain, the native Chaga people have been living peacefully since the 11th century AD. They grow wheat and sunflowers, as well as bananas, and even harvest coffee beans. In 2000, geologists with Ohio State University traveled to Kilimanjaro to collect ice core samples. At 19,000 feet, they took six samples from the ice. By investigating the ice samples, scientists were able to determine that 8,300 years ago, a massive drought affected the land. For 500 years, very little rain fell. The mountain lost most of its ice, and several lakes in Africa dried up completely. Then there was another drought that occurred around 4,000 years ago, at the same time that the events of the Book of Genesis supposedly took place. The Bible's Book of Genesis describes the story of Joseph, and it's extremely bizarre. In the biblical tale, Joseph was gifted a luxurious coat that his brothers grew envious of. In a fit of jealousy, Joseph's brothers sold him to a group of traders and smeared goat blood all over his fancy coat. Joseph was then sent off to Egypt to be a slave. But while in captivity, Joseph had a vision of the future. He saw that there would be a great harvest for seven years, followed by seven years of drought and widespread famine. He told the pharaoh and everyone was saved. This coincides with the drought that hit Mount Kilimanjaro and was proven by the ice core samples. Simple pieces of ice seem to have successfully provided evidence that some biblical events in Genesis truly took place in the distant past. Penguins from Space On the coastline of Antarctica, there are over 60 colonies of emperor penguins. But what's really fascinating is that over half of the penguin colonies were only discovered thanks to scientists using satellites. These satellite images have helped reveal 33 out of 66 known penguin groups. Researchers do this by tracking large quantities of bird poop, also called guano. It can be seen on the icy Antarctic landscape as huge deposits of brown gunk. The penguins, when they move to a new spot, leave behind guano stains that can easily be identified from space. Most recently, scientists uncovered an entirely new colony consisting of about 500 penguins in West Antarctica. Researchers have called it a welcome development, since this species is due to come under threat as Antarctica gets warmer. Sadly, emperor penguins require ice to live. These flightless birds have made their home in Antarctica, and any loss of sea ice will be detrimental to their survival. Some climate projections show that 80% of the colonies on Antarctica will be gone by the end of the century. This means these 500 penguins that were only recently discovered could soon be homeless as the Antarctic ice melts. Meteorites in Antarctica A cluster of meteorites was recently found in Antarctica, pieces of space rock that could contain the secrets of our planet. From between December 11, 2022 to January 11, 2023, an international team of researchers retrieved five meteorites while doing a reconnaissance mission in Antarctica. These space rocks were found on a part of the continent called Antarctica Blue Ice, not far from the Belgian Princess Elizabeth Antarctica Station. This was hardly the first time meteorites have been found in Antarctica. Over the last three missions near the station, scientists have found over 600 meteorites. Apparently, it's the best place to find space rocks because they are so easy to spot in the pale white snow. These five new meteorites are particularly interesting for one main reason. According to Maria Schoenbachler, a member of the research team, the meteorites are made of chondrites, the oldest kind of rock material we know about in the universe. Think of them as prehistoric rocks, the most ancient rocks that can be found on our planet. Scientists are hoping that by understanding more about these meteorites, they can unlock the secrets of our planet's formation, which took place roughly 4.5 billion years ago. Analysis is currently being done by scientists at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. The Perfect Arrow on a remote ice patch in Norway, a team of scientists found a perfectly preserved arrow from the Iron Age. The story of the discovery starts in 2011. This was when the Langfawn and Lendbreen ice patches in Norway began to melt. Dramatically, the melting of the ice revealed ancient passes that were used by Europeans between 500 BC and 800 AD. These old trails were used by travelers and merchants to move through the Jotunheim Mountains up until the age of the Vikings. 
During their travels, the people left a lot of their stuff behind. They would throw their garbage on the side of the trail, or sometimes they would lose their equipment. Many of the objects they lost became covered by ice and snow over time, where they remained frozen for hundreds of years. But in 2011, the ice started melting, and all of these ancient treasures were revealed for the first time. Researchers have found a lot of cool things in the past decade, but the recently discovered arrow is definitely one of the more interesting finds. According to experts, it's 1,300 years old. Archaeologists say it belonged to a hunter, and that it was discovered lodged between some stones that had previously been covered in ice. Dr. Lars Pilo said the team uncovered the arrow at a staggering height of 5,700 feet above sea level. Early hunters had likely been tracking animals across the ice sheets. And for some unknown reason, one of the hunters dropped an arrow. Maybe it missed its mark, or it could have fallen from the hunter's quiver. But whatever the case may be, the arrow got lodged under a rock and was completely forgotten about for over 1,000 years. Anthrax spores Did you know there was a zombie outbreak in Siberia? While this might sound strange, there was an unusual heat wave in western Siberia, causing all kinds of things to thaw out, including a frozen reindeer that had been hidden in the ice for 75 years. This reindeer had fallen victim to zombie anthrax, a common bacteria found in the wilderness all over the world. After being dormant all this time, the melting ice allowed the spores to be released once more, causing havoc and killing more than 2,000 reindeer. Members of the indigenous Nanette community had to be relocated. The spores spread through the soil, and as the animals graze, they pick up the bacteria, which spreads like wildfire in the animal's blood. The bacteria needs a rotting host in order to create spores, which can then spread some more. Humans most likely pick it up from eating infected animals. Now, there are vaccines and antibiotics which are very effective in treating the infection. But it is scary to think what other dormant diseases lie hidden in the permafrost, biding their time as the ice melts. Lion Cubs in Russia in late 2017, a local resident of Russia's far northeastern Yakutia region discovered the frozen remains of a one-year-old lion cub. This baby big cat was a cave lion, which is believed to have died out about 10,000 years ago. Scientists called him Boris. Two years earlier, two other intact frozen cubs had been found, named Uyan and Dina. The 12,000-year-old remains of the two cubs were an amazing find for the scientific community. The more recently discovered cub was handed over for examination to Dr. Albert Protopopov, a paleontologist at Russia's Republic Academy of Science, who had also studied Uyan and Dina. Boris was found on the bank of a river in perfect condition. He is believed to have been between six to eight weeks old when he died. Tufts of fur are still sticking out from the cub's remains, which are roughly the size of an adult's forearm. Most remarkably, the cub's face can still be seen resting on one of its paws. Another cub was also found near the same place as Boris. Named Spartak, this kitten has fur and a long tail that has all remained intact. Scientists believe they most likely died in an avalanche. A team of international scientists are working on finding more remains of ancient animals to clone this species back to life. Would you like to see a cave lion running around again? Let me know in the comments! Prehistoric Worms Scientists have announced that two nematodes, or microscopic worms that live in the soil, have been brought back to life in a petri dish after being suspended in a deep freeze in the Siberian permafrost for 42,000 years. The same worms were actually brought back to life. After carefully thawing the ice that had surrounded the roundworms since the days of the woolly mammoth, Scientists at the Institute of Physical, Chemical, and Biological Problems of Soil Science, located near Moscow, coaxed them back into existence. Wow, that's a very specific institute. Researchers witnessed the worms moving and eating, and according to the study, this marked the first evidence of natural cryopreservation of multicellular animals. A team of Russian researchers and geoscientists from Princeton University in New Jersey had found the two suitable candidates by analyzing over 300 worms. One of the worms had been discovered in 2015 near the Alizea River in Yakutia in eastern Siberia and was believed to be 41,700 years old. The other, which was 32,000 years old, was taken in 2002 near northeastern Siberia's Kolyma River. 
The successful experiment represents a scientific breakthrough in the cryonics and astrobiology fields, demonstrating that multicellular organisms can withstand the test of time when preserved in ice. Cryonics, a study that has largely been considered to be more a product of science fiction than actual science, aims to suspend people in time by freezing their bodies. We are closer to this becoming a reality than you might have thought. Walnut Brains The Ampelosaurus was a truly gigantic dinosaur, measuring in at a whopping 50 feet long. And yet despite being a titanic monster that could crush a car with one foot, its entire body was regulated by a brain roughly the size of a walnut. And this is only one example. Something surprising you might not know is that many prehistoric creatures had unflatteringly small brains. It all started in 1912, when Jenny Irene Mix described the Diplodocus as having a brain not much larger than a walnut. This soon became a kind of go-to unit of measurements. In 1945, famous paleontologist Edwin Colbert said the Stegosaurus, everyone's favorite armor-plated dinosaur, had a brain the size of a small edible seed. In other words, about the size of a walnut. When the 50-foot-long Ampelosaurus was described by paleontologist Ryan Ridgely, he said its brain was not much larger than a tennis ball. But that comparison turned out to be way too generous. A tennis ball has a volume of roughly 140 cc, but the brain endocast of an Ampelosaurus only had a volume of about 39.5 cc. So again, similar to a walnut. As you can tell, dinosaurs had seriously small brains. No matter how many species of sauropods are found, large dinosaurs like the Brontosaurus are included in the sauropod family, the brains just don't seem to get any bigger. Scientists aren't sure exactly why, but the bigger the dinosaur was, the smaller its brain seemed to be. Are you surprised by this? Let me know in the comments! The Two-Legged Croc There was once a crocodile that could run on its hind legs like an angry ostrich. This shocking creature is called the Caprosuchus, and it was one of the most frightening things that ever walked the face of this planet. It lived in the late Cretaceous period, meaning between 95 and 100 million years ago. It would have resided in swampy, wet areas alongside many of the most famous dinosaurs. It most likely dined on many of your favorite dinosaurs. However, it was a biological crocodile. The Caprosuchus was a direct relative of modern crocs. The big difference was that it possessed an extraordinary sprinting ability and had teeth like tusks. The teeth of the Caprosuchus were longer than any other known crocodile. It had three pairs of teeth like walrus tusks, making it part wild boar. They were so long that they likely stuck outside of its mouth, stretching past its snout. There has only ever been a single skull found to prove the Caprosuchus existed. And yet from that single skull, researchers have learned a lot. Just from recreating its head, they were able to figure out what its legs were like. Scientists think its legs gave it the ability to walk on land, strutting about like a bird. Instead of running after its prey on four legs, it's believed it got up on its hind legs and sprinted at unimaginable speeds. This means that modern crocodiles at some point lost the ability to sprint. It's shout out time! I want to say a big thank you to Blessed Beauty and Isaac Brill for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about prehistoric creatures. The Dino Dance Dinosaurs used to dance like their lives depended on it. For a very long time, paleontologists have studied dinosaurs and wondered what their mating rituals may have looked like. Since many dinosaurs were the original ancestors of modern birds, it seems fair to think they participated in similar rituals. And that means dancing. Just like how birds throw elaborate dance parties to impress potential mates, carnivorous theropods like the T-Rex may have used some sick dance moves as well. A group of paleontologists recently tried to get to the bottom of the mystery. They studied scrape marks left behind by prehistoric beasts in Colorado. The lead scientist on the project, Martin Lockley, says the markings are the first physical evidence of dinosaur foreplay. Martin went on to say dinosaurs had incredible vision, were feathery and colorful, and often had head crests. Even the T-Rex was a visual animal, understanding its environment through sight. 
In a chunk of sandstone about 100 million years old, scientists found markings left behind by a dinosaur dance. The irregular groupings are almost identical to what can be found etched in the dirt after a group of birds get together to compete for mates. When birds do this, they leave behind the same kinds of markings in the dirt from their quick-moving legs. The discovery suggests that dinosaurs, even the mighty Tyrannosaurus rex, danced up a storm when it was time to find a partner. But what kind of dancing did they do? Martin believes the patterns to be most similar to those left by modern puffins and ostriches. As hard to imagine as it may be, dinosaurs were dancing geniuses. The monstrous Paraceratherium what you may not know is that about 33 million years ago, there was a giant beast called the Paraceratherium, a type of rhino without a horn, and much larger than a giraffe. It weighed a shocking 17 tons and stood 16 feet at the shoulder. That makes the Paraceratherium one of the largest animals that ever lived. It resided across Western Europe and throughout Asia. It was a giant hornless rhino with a neck like a giraffe and a body like an elephant. This was by far one of the most unusual animals to ever exist. As an herbivore, the Paraceratherium spent most of its time eating vegetation. Because it was so big, it could graze the treetops that no other animals could reach. It even had a kind of trunk that it used to help scrape foliage from branches. That means the rhino was also equipped with an elephant's trunk, adding even more to its weirdness. And as if that weren't enough, these gentle giants were nocturnal. Because they were so massive, they likely had large ears to help dissipate their body heat. This is the same reason African elephants have such big ears, to help regulate their heat. Because grazing in the daytime would have surely killed them, the Paraceratherium only came out at night. Venomous Saliva Did you know there used to be giant lizards with venomous saliva? Australia, in particular, was home to some very scary reptiles, even scarier than the ones that live there now. During the Pleistocene era, starting about 50,000 years ago, there was a species of giant monitor lizard called the Megalania. It was the biggest lizard that existed, at least the biggest we know about. It grew anywhere between 11 and 23 feet and could have weighed up to 4,000 pounds. This wasn't a dinosaur, though. It was a lizard. Just imagine the scaly bearded dragon at your local pet store, except 4,000 pounds and bigger than a truck. Australia was overrun with these creepy reptiles. Scientists believe the Megalania is most closely related to the modern Komodo dragon. The Komodo dragon is known for killing its victims with venom secreted through saliva. And that's how the Megalania hunted as well. The first indigenous settlers of Australia may have even encountered these beasts before driving them off the edge of extinction. For the first people to arrive in Australia by boat, coming across a lizard the size of a dragon must have been horrifying. It's no wonder that the natives would have taken it upon themselves to hunt Megalania until they were all gone. Do you think you would be able to take on a Megalania? Let me know in the comments! The Mystery of Prehistoric Plants each night as the sun goes down, plants around the world fall asleep. Many species, some you may know like daisies, curl their leaves and petals and rest until the morning. It's a fascinating behavior that scientists recently tracked back to 250 million years ago. Researchers found bite marks left on fossilized plants by ancient insects. The unique bite marks show that insects were feasting strictly on folded leaves meaning that they were hunting at night. This has led experts to think that the extinct group of plants curled up and went to sleep at sunset just like many modern plants do. The discovery was made with help from Stephen McLaughlin at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in Stockholm. He and his team looked at extremely ancient plants from the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. Many of these plants show that they were eaten by insects at night while curled up. But here's why that's so strange. Scientists have no idea why plants fold their leaves at night. It's something that's been talked about by naturalists since at least 324 BC. That was when Androsthenes of Thasos, a good friend of Alexander the Great, documented the phenomenon. Charles Darwin even talked about it in 1880 in his book The Power of Movement in Plants. But even though the phenomenon has been happening for 250 million years, scientists can't figure out what the point of curling up at night is. Maybe they're just like us. Maybe the plants just want to be cozy. Do you have any theories? 
Let me know in the comments. Why no dinosaurs, Washington? The Pacific Northwest is truly one of the most wild places in America. With its lush rainforests, rocky coastline, and verdant hills, it seems like the perfect place to find dinosaur bones. The Pacific Northwest, and specifically Washington State, should be rich in dinosaur bones, right? The shocking truth is that never in history have paleontologists ever found a complete set of dinosaur bones in Washington. The place in America that looks the most prehistoric doesn't even have any prehistoric dinosaurs to call its own. It wasn't until 2012 that a dinosaur femur was found on Susha Island, and even then, the dinosaur fossil was found in a rock that had been flung onto land by a rogue wave. It may not have even come from Washington. Other than that, the state is bare of dinosaurs. In 2019, a fourth grade class at an elementary school in Tacoma tried to get a state dinosaur going. But because there was only that single femur found on Susha Island, the Sushasaurus rex was the only dinosaur that could become a sort of mascot for the state. But there was a problem. Researchers with the Burke Museum said it was unclear if the dinosaur was even a unique species. Sushasaurus is only a placeholder name. Nothing about it is official. Dr. Katherine Anderson with the museum says the fossil was only deposited in Washington because of tectonic activity. The fossil in the rock migrated north and ended up on the island. It never lived in Washington. As far as experts are concerned, there still has never been a dinosaur found in Washington state. Fingerfish you may be familiar with how life evolved from the ocean, with animals evolving limbs and crawling out from the seas to populate the land. What you might not know is that scientists recently discovered a fish from 380 million years ago that had fingers. Scientists believe the discovery of this skeleton could show exactly how animals moved from fins to fingers. A tetrapod is any animal with four limbs. And although humans have five digits radiating from our palms, other tetrapods use their limbs differently. For birds and bats, their hands are part of their wings. Their skeletal fingers with thin flesh stretched between them allow the animals to fly. From birds to elephants to humans, the basic structure is exactly the same. Charles Darwin talked about this in 1859 when discussing the origin of species. Bats, horses, Dolphins, moles, and people all have the same pattern of small bones in relatively the same positions. Darwin's theory was that we all evolved from a common ancestor, the first creature with digits. 160 years after Darwin, scientists may have found our ancestral fish. Its skeleton was discovered in Miguasha National Park in Quebec. It appears to be the first instance of a complete prehistoric fish with the presence of an arm, forearm, and carpal bones. Those are the bones in our wrists. It also had tiny bones that hadn't quite evolved into fingers yet. Mammoth poo. There is one fact about the legendary woolly mammoth that you may have never heard before. It's not the most glorious of facts, but it is worth knowing, maybe. Scientists recently inspected some preserved chunks of ancient mammoth refuse and discovered that the extinct creatures once ate their own waste for dinner. The team of scientists behind the discovery was led by Bas van Giel from the University of Amsterdam. They uncovered fungus spores inside an ancient piece of mammoth dung, spores which only grow on the outside of dung. What this means is that the mammoth must have eaten its own poo. It is the only scientific explanation. You may be thinking the discovery is just a fluke. Maybe there was one weird mammoth who had an unusual eating habit 12,000 years ago. But there was another similar discovery made in 2006. The discovery has now been made enough times that scientists are fairly certain this was a widely practiced habit. The why is what really has scientists scratching their heads. Nobody knows why woolly mammoths resorted to eating their own waste. Some specialists have suggested it may have been out of desperation. Mammoths may have been starving during particularly rough winters. This may have left them no choice but to eat their leftovers. Either that, or they were just trying to maintain a balanced diet by eating recycled grass. Tiny Horses 55 million years ago, the temperature in North America changed significantly. Temperatures suddenly skyrocketed, and the entire North American continent became smoking hot. 
When that happened, the animals living there started to change. This was especially true for horses. As the temperatures rose, horses started to shrink. Prehistoric horses went from being about the size of a small dog to the size of a small house cat. Here's the secret truth about the evolution of the horse. In the beginning, horses were no bigger than your pet dog. They dwelled in the forests of Canada and the USA and looked fairly similar to the horses still alive now. The only difference was that they were really small. Then came the scorching heat. Horses shrank to become the size of house cats and then, shortly after, began to grow again. As horses grew in size, they also started to diversify. Around 12 million years ago, horses had become about the size they are today. And by 3.5 million years ago, horses had spread into other areas of the world. The temperature was dropping, things were getting colder, and horses moved from North America into Eurasia. That marked the beginnings of the modern horse, which is still alive today. The secret is that in the beginning, horses were tiny. They were so small that only a baby monkey could ride one. Would you like to have a tiny prehistoric horse as a pet? Let me know in the comments below and thanks for watching! Remember to hit that subscribe button and come back soon for more amazing videos on ancient history! Bye!